Hey guys, welcome to the Real Estate Jam podcast. My name is JD and I'm super excited because we have an awesome show for you today. Today we have our guest, Mike Cowper. Mike is a real estate uh, investor and he's also part of the Inner Circle Elite Mastermind and he helps a lot of different people through mentorship. But because in his business, he runs a lot of the acquisitions appointments, we have the unique ability to have him go through his sales process. There's a ton of value in today's episode. So make sure you get your notepad and take notes because he's dropping value left and right. Sit back, listen, and learn. They don't want what we know out there. How a person can go from really almost nothing to becoming a millionaire by owning rental property. He would always buy these flip houses and I just remember thinking, this guy is crazy. Why would he buy that house? In the past decade, there's been a huge surge in the peer-to-peer short-term rental market. Become an insider. So you have to know the rules before you get the game. Every second counts. So make every second count. Welcome to the Real Estate Jam. Whether you're just beginning or the best of the best, we're glad you're here. We will share successes, failures, and strategies for the action-taking real estate investor. And now to your hosts, JD, Annabelle, and Melissa. All right, well, it's another exciting episode here. We have another guest we're really excited about. He is a leader in the mastermind that we're a part of, the Inner Circle Elite. And he is also a real estate investor. So we're really excited to hear about kind of what you got going on in your market. And can you tell us a little about yourself, Mike? We got Mike Cowper today and uh, we're excited to have you on. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me on. Um, I guess the, the best place to start is when I got started. So I have been investing since 2014. Uh, I, I recognized pretty early on that there's a lot of things that you can learn and need to know to be successful in real estate investing. So I actually started off my career um, getting coaching right from the beginning. And I think that really helped me shortcut a lot of that. Um, you know, a lot of the learning curve, a lot of the processes, a lot of the struggles that people can have, just the the unknowing of the unknown. It's a pretty scary place to be at times. And um, unfortunately, I, either they weren't around or I didn't know how to find them properly. But uh, podcasts like this are so much more beneficial nowadays than they were. And just the available information, people that are willing to be open and sharing about what they do. So um, I jumped into getting coaching right from the beginning because I figured it was something, you know, I I had a successful sales career. I had some extra capital that I could invest in myself. So I started doing that, um, bought my first rental in November of 2014, um, bought two or three more before I ended up networking and starting to really try and take advantage of the value of people in, you know, a positive way. So I started going around and essentially just reaching out to everybody in my local market to take them to coffee, to try and learn more, try to get in touch with successful investors to see what they were doing and if there was ways that I could be, you know, uh, a help to them. I know a lot of people talk about, you know, go find a mentor. And and what I found is that can be kind of challenging because when they tell you to go find a mentor, a lot of it doesn't tell you on how to go about finding a mentor. Because if you just come up and walk to somebody, hey, will you be my mentor? I I mean, I can tell from experience now is that means it's going to take a lot of my time. And there's maybe if I'm lucky, a 50, 50 shot, you're going to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of why I think a lot of people are resistant to take on that quote unquote mentee relationship. But in that process, I found my partner, Mike Simmons, and him and I decided to form what was now return on investments. But essentially, as I met him uh, at a coffee shop, he was in a position where he was starting to grow his business out of flipping more into wholesaling. I had a unique skill set of the sales part of the equation where I could go and run the appointments for him and manage calls to do a lot of sales, follow-ups and and activities based around that because that wasn't ever his core uh, strength or foundation. He could definitely do it. Everybody can do it. So if you don't think you're a salesperson, you haven't got enough no's yet because I think everyone can become good at sales. It might not be uh, the biggest thing that you're, 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 you're calling or your passion, but if done right, you can turn it into a process. So I was able to work with him and we kind of partnered I actually more of an employee employer relationship. I offered to basically work for him for free. I, I said, Hey, you know, we met, you told me these are the things that you're struggling with or you want to move into. I think I can help with a, B and C and kind of put together this email and an outline of where I thought I could help him and offer to do it for free. 
he was nice enough to actually pay me for my work. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, from there I was able to, you know, show that I had value and ultimately we decided it made more sense to work together than, you know, eventually potentially being competitors. Uh, you know, the thought process behind that was, you know, if the two of us combined could be more than either of us individually, then it made more sense. So we decided to go that route, um, joined another mastermind group that helped us go from, you know, $300,000 a year to over a million dollars a year after one year of being a part of higher level investors. And that's why, you know, I, I bring back to that point a lot that if you surround yourself with the right kind of people who know what they're doing and actually care about you and your success, and they're, they're open to sharing everything that's going on, not just the good, but also the bad, it can really help take a lot of the teeth out of, you know, trying something new because you know that they can help guide you through some of those issues. And it's not going to be one-to-one. It's not exactly what um, they did or what they do, but um, joining that group helped us get to where we wanted to be. And then over time, you know, we just kind of grew apart the businesses um, that did for masterminds. And that's why we decided to grow, I mean, uh, start our own, the inner circle elite. And we could talk a little about that later, but um, yeah, that's kind of my start in a long winded way to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. There's all, uh, quite a few things that, there that I'd, I'd like to touch on. Um, and, and our partnership was formed through, through a mastermind and we, realize the benefit of partnerships. I'm wondering, um, how do you, how do you guys structure it? Uh, technically, do you, you have everything written out? Is it a handshake deal? Uh, what did you guys do to protect yourselves individually as well as the business? So this is going to tell everybody what not to do, but essentially <laughs> it, it's, I mean, for real, it's almost a handshake agreement. We have an operating agreement. I don't know if I've ever read it. Um, <laughs> it's like, it's one of those things that I, I trust Mike implicitly. So, and he does the same for me. Um, we've talked about, you know, what might happen if something happens. And I think we're kind of have verbal agreements on that, um, you know, should something happen. But I mean, to be entirely honest, we should have something a little bit more formalized on how, you know, what happens if I get hit by a bus or what happens if I win the lottery or he wins the lottery or you know, something like that happens. Because as much as I love Mike and his wife and his family and he loves me, my family, my kids and all of that, I don't know that I want to be business partners with them. But at the same point, you know, I'm, just, it's just kind of what we thought is that, you know, we still want our families to have the benefit of the business mm -hmm. that we've created, but not necessarily um, the ability to have strong say or any say in, you know, the operational or the decisions of the group, I mean, of the company. But we do want to make sure that, you know, we're spending all this time, energy and effort to put something together that should be sustainable long term. We want to make sure that our families are covered for that as well. And um, we've got some pretty loose ideas on what that looks like. And I just know that, you know, if something were to happen to me, Mike would take care of my family and I'd take care of his. But um, yeah, it's not as formalized as it probably should be. And that kind of goes back to, you know, some of the flaws I have in my own personality of not being the most detail oriented person, but also very trusting person. <laughs> well, flaws or, or a benefit. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I have a follow-up question on that, Mike. So how do y'all um assign like duties or how do you know who's going to do what so that you have forward momentum? A lot of that comes down to planning and just being able to be open and honest and communicate well with one another. Uh, and, and that changes over time. So what the way it started off, it was, you know, I was all on the acquisition side. He was all on the disposition side. That was just him and I working. So I'd get cop properties under contract. He'd get them sold in the assignment phase. Um, as we've grown, you know, we have, uh, you know, evolved what it is we do. We have more team members on our team. We have more processes to manage. So over time, that's kind of looked differently. Like I've ran, uh, you know, different parts of our team for a little bit, and he's ran different parts of our team for a little bit. And really, I think what it comes down to is what are you best suited for at that given time and being able to recognize if it's something's not working and being able to, you know, call each other out if necessary about, hey, you know, this isn't working, why not? And is it because you're not good at it? Is it because you're not doing it? Um, is it because it's a bad idea? Because sometimes you don't know if it's a good or a bad idea or you're doing the right thing until you've tried it out. So we try to really keep everything almost on like that quarterly cycle, right? Every 90 days, we try to evaluate, plan for the next 90 days, review what's done well, what's done bad, if something's still too early to tell or if it's something you need to make it on. So a lot of it really does come down to being able to communicate, plan, and strategize together. Yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. That's 
That's great. So um, you've been in charge of the acquisitions. Do you, do you have a, a team of acquisitions agents right now? Or are you still running the majority of the appointments? What does that look like in your guys' business? It's actually split up pretty evenly between me and another person. Um, <clears throat> we've had teams of acquisitions agents. We have found, and, and I think it's pretty universal, that that's probably one of the more difficult positions to fill because, yeah. you know, sales is the lifeblood of almost every single business. And a lot of established companies, like, you know, those blue chip kind of companies that have big bankrolls and they have big systems and teams and, and operations, they can support a higher, I guess, um, risk tolerance and give people a longer runway than a lot of us, you know, individual business owners can. Yeah. So that's where we've always found the, the biggest struggle. Um, right now it's about, you know, 50, 50, maybe I get a little bit more than our other person just because that, you know, being, I think, I hate to say it this way, but I feel like I'm the best salesperson out there. And I think I'm going to get the deals when I go on them. And just to make sure that the company's in the best health, that's where I find my passion to be. That's where I am the best at what I do. It's something I like to do. And I think it's where I add the most value to our company. So it's something that I've tried to pull out of at times. And then I end up finding that I'm stir crazy and I'm not a great manager. I don't like double checking people's work. I like to keep moving forward, keep trying new things, keep doing new things, have uh, unique experiences. And, and in a sales call, every unique experience is, I mean, every dip experience is different and unique because every person has a different problem or a different, uh, you know, solution that we need to come to and being able to dissect that and uncover those things and try to put together the best solution is really something I enjoy. And I think, you know, one of another one of our mentors, Don Costa, he talks a lot about that in understanding what your core competencies are and then using those to your partnerships or your company's advantage, definitely. Um, since your core competency is sales, can you give us kind of maybe your top three sales tricks or sales advice that you have to the aspiring real estate investor or the, our next awesome acquisition specialist? Yeah, and it's hard to say there's just three. Um, and the thing is, because there's no silver bullet out there. You know, you, you see or hear all these programs and, you know, uh, on Facebook and whatnot, you know, top this, top that to, to get your deals increased by a thousand million percent. You know, in, in reality, that's not realistic. There's definitely um, tactics and strategies and processes that you can follow that give you the best opportunity to be successful. But I would say the number one thing is actually spending the time and having uh, a true caring personality or or at least being empathetic to the situation. I think a lot of people, when they get into this, they are taught, you know, it's all about the numbers, which ultimately end of the day, the numbers have to work. But what I have found is if you truly understand what it is that person that's thinking of selling their home is going through and uncover the, the pain points, like the true pain points, because everyone's going to say, I want to get the most from my house, most money from my house possible. Mm -hmm. That's a no duh. Um, but understanding what it is they're going through and the challenges they're trying to overcome and then trying to provide a solution with a number that works for us, that I think will increase the opportunities that you can convert. And it goes back to people care, you know, they, they trust and like people that care about them and can do what they say they're going to do. There's plenty of times that people take contracts with me that's either more, uh, less money than they're offering or, you know, the same, but I know what it is that they're going through and I have been able to convey it in a way to them that, hey, here's why we're the best fit for what you're trying to do. Yeah. And having that trust built and, and taking the time to build the trust, and, and it doesn't actually take all that long. Like if you spend 30, 40 minutes with somebody at their house or on the phone, you can spend and uncover a lot of information doing that. So I think actually coming from the perspective of we're trying to solve a problem here and it's got to be a win-win solution, then I think that is, gives you the best opportunity to convert leads. Um, on top of that, I would say following a process and that's a, a challenge for a lot of salespeople if they're kind of more that natural, you know, wild, wild west, you know, gunslinger type of, of uh, salespeople, which a lot of them are, they're not great at Typically, you know, being detail oriented, not typically good at following process, like putting notes into your CRM, maybe doing follow ups in an appropriate amount of time. And the reason I think I'm successful as well is because I have forced myself into a habit of doing that. I, I put very detailed notes in there, even though it's against my nature to a degree. But over time, I now have an actual encyclopedia of all the people I've talked with. 
And having that encyclopedia allows me to pick up the ball, you know, to use a sports analogy and run with it whenever it is that we reconnect with them. So I'm always taking that ball and trying to push it a little bit further down the field every time I call them. And I can now just spend a couple minutes before I reach out or connect with them or if they call me and I can be right up to speed on exactly where we were at last time and we don't have to retread anything. So it's not like I'm going two steps, you know, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step. I'm right there and I'm trying to keep the ball moving forward, forward, forward on every step of the way. And I think following a good process is, is what allows you to do that. So having a good process. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to, I was just going to say, could you give us a, a little bit of what your sales process is and explain it? Um, you know, kind of what, what that process actually looks like for you guys. Yeah. And so I'll start off high level that way it can kind of mass hit, hit everybody. And if you just want to dig in on anything that works as well. Um, but I mean, it starts off with a lead. They've called us, they've reached out, we've reached out to them. Somehow we've connected with that potential lead. So the first phase of the sales process is understanding and uncovering, right? We're doing the discovery process. Mm -hmm. We've got to know why it is they're looking to sell our house. And some of the, the, the big three questions that I want our, our intake people to get is, um, you know, why are you looking to sell your house? I just need to understand why. Why sell your house at all? Um, how much they're hoping to get for it? You know, how, it was, if they don't have a number in mind and they won't share that, I've been struggling to try and remember a time and maybe it's happened, but it doesn't ever pop up. I don't know if I've ever bought a house if someone hasn't given me any number on the phone. Okay. And, and, and it could be a crazy number. I've gotten big reductions from what they said on the phone, but if they don't give me a number, and I think Don Costa, because he's a, a genius at this stuff, but he had mentioned it, I don't know if it was on passing or not, um, but it, it really stuck with me. If they're not willing to share a number, they're probably not ready to sell their house yet. Mm -hmm. So I, I found that to be pretty true. And then the last thing I want to know is how quickly are you looking to sell and move out? And I, I say it that way because move out connects the dots to them that, hey, this is final. You've got to be out of this house. So I think it just helps subliminally connect that dot a little bit more for them. So those are the big three things I want to get on there on that first call. And then, you know, depending on how the conversation goes, we don't want to make it too long. We don't want to turn it into an interrogation, but we want to build that rapport. Mm -hmm. right? It's something that everybody talks about, build that rapport. It's, it's really just trying to take the time to understand what they're going through, answer any questions they might have, and then schedule a time to, to go out there and take a look at their house if it's something that seems like it's a good fit for both of us. We usually do try to err on the side of scheduling because we can always cancel after doing some research because, you know, Zillow, while it might be getting better and things like that, um, they're still not all that accurate. And it takes some time to run some comps because maybe there's something there that, you know, we weren't seeing that we think they might want more than it's actually worth, but maybe, you know, after doing some due diligence, it's fine. Or when I call them back, because the next step in the process is, you know, first doing the due, the, uh, due diligence and pre-work, understanding what that house is worth, what type of repairs we're expecting to get out of it or having to do to it for either us or the end investor, if we're going to wholesale it. And then the last part of the pre-work is calling them back as the acquisitions person. So if it's two different people, that handoff is, you know, it's pretty smooth. We let them know they're going to call prior to coming on the appointment, just introduce themselves, answer any questions. They might have to have some clarifying questions themselves. It's kind of how we set it up. And then I, I try to go back into that of, you know, okay, well, you told our intake person, ABC, can you tell me more about that? So now I've just, you know, peeled that onion back a little bit further. I've taken it a little bit further down the path and they can't just tell me the same stuff that they told our other person already, because sometimes that's where the default people want to go is they just want to tell the, the surface part of the story. Right. We need to get to the heart of the matter and understand that. And by asking, you know, tell me more about this and specifically saying what they've already said, it kind of shortcuts that and it short circuits them a little bit because now they can't just tell the same story again because we want to get more to the meat of it and more of the, you know, the understanding of why, what's going on. And in this point, I usually like to ask them, well, like, why, why don't you just listen to the real estate agent? Okay. seems like a lot of investors are scared of that question as if they hadn't thought about it. But <laughs> everybody's first instinct is I should sell this with a real estate agent because that's what everybody knows. A lot of people don't know services like ours exist where we can help people buy their house cash, do it fast or buy it in any condition. And I mean, to be fair, there, there's a certain amount of investors out there that get taught the wrong things or, or are unethical and then they give some of us a bad name. Um, you know, luckily us, you know, our two businesses aren't in that, that faction, but, um, you know, there's, you know, there's bad people in any industry and it seems like in our industry, it, they get a bad name and it kind of goes across the board. So we're really trying to understand why, why not just list this? And that will in turn usually give us other ways that we can sell them. Not only do they tell us about these problems, but now they've either reinforced what they've already told us 
and gone a little bit deeper because now they, they're either explaining why they can't listen with a real estate agent or don't want to. And now we can start tailoring our presentation and our solutions to that. And, and the reason I'm being a little bit vague on all this is because every person's reason and why is going to be different. I can't tell you what there are. There's, there's probably some big ones out there that are, are similar, right? Maybe they're losing the taxes, foreclosure, a death in the family, inheritance, um, you know, job move, medical bills. Like there's, there's all kinds of reasons out there, but that macro reason isn't the most important part, right? Getting to that and understand how it individually impacts them and their personal life is going to be different for every single one. And if we can get to that point, our likelihood for success is going to be much, much higher. So that's the pre-work. Um, after that, then, you know, if everything still looks in line and it seems like a good opportunity still, we'll go out there. Then we go on the appointment. I typically like to start off just sitting down and, you know, introduce myself in person, rehashing even more of what we've already talked about, right? Peeling that onion even a third time now. You've told me this, this, and this. Anything else I should know? I try to get to more in the feeling-based uh, questions now. So now, like, hey, how's that make you feel? What is this going to impact your life? How would it feel once this is sold? What are you going to do with the money? So starting to start, pick, uh, pre- I guess, building out that landscape for them of what this could look like if you take this anchor of a house off of them. Because the house, while it's an anchor, it's not the problem. <laughs> So uh, I like to rehash that. Then um, I asked them to give me a tour. And I say, hey, you mind pointing out anything? I mean, this is your house. You know it better than I do. And, and I just walk through it. And then I ask you, is it all right if I take some pictures while I'm going through here? Because I see a lot of houses. I want to make sure I don't forget anything. And then, you know, we also do shares with our partners that help, you know, either work with us on these deals or finance them. And then I'll just take pictures while I'm going through it and having them kind of telling me more about the situation. Because once you start walking around, people start to open up too. Because it feels, again... <laughs> little less like an interrogation and, and I try never to make them feel like that, but sometimes it's just a natural instinct. Hey, they're, I'm trying to hold this stuff back. And then when they're walking around the house, sometimes it opens up a little bit more opportunity. So paying attention, listening, and then writing down any of the work that I think is needed. And then another thing I don't like to do is, you know, call their baby ugly. So don't be super direct. Like, Oh, that's terrible. You gotta do this. You gotta do that. You gotta do this. I've bought houses from people because some guy came in and he was an a-hole, right? <laughs> like, yeah. They just kept calling all this stuff ugly. I go, you know, your house is fine. If you come to my house, you'll probably find a lot of similar things that I need to do to sell it. But, um, you know, if we're going to resell it, we've got to have it to a certain level. So I try to explain to them that, you know, you can kind of, a lot of these issues and a lot of the houses you go into, but if you want to resell, this is what the market's looking for at this time. So I won't call it ugly, but I'll say I probably have to change this out just because they're expecting granite countertops or they're expecting this color cabinet, or we need to paint it with neutral color or the flooring. While it's nice, it's not quite new. And people are looking for this kind of thing. So I try to explain to them, it, but I don't call their stuff ugly. And if it's something really bad, I'll just take a picture of it, right? I'm walking around with them. I'll put my camera right at it, take a picture of it, not saying anything. We all know what happened. We all know where I saw it. And there's no reason to, to you know, prod that any further. Mm-hmm. So after going through the, the house, taking down notes, that's when I sit down and, and I kind of just start to confirm that they're ready to sell their house and make a decision. I, I don't like to just give out numbers because that kind of takes away a lot of your power. It gives them the opportunity to just, you know, ghost you and, and try to shop it around. So I literally never leave a written contract with anybody. The best I'll do is write a number on a, on a business card. And then <laughs> that, I just don't want people out there. Uh, I'm either shopping my contract around, but I also tell them before, you know, when I'm warming them up for the you know, negotiation and offers, is there any reason you're not able to sign a contract right now if we can agree on price? Okay. Is there any reason you wouldn't be able to just say no or yeah. say yes? So I want to uncover stuff prior to giving them that number. And then I, I kind of just tell them, hey, you know, based on the work that's needed, you know, we, we're an investing company. We've got to make money too. I'd like to be at this number. And that first number for me is the home run number, right? It, it's it's kind of has some of the uh, sales tactics of anchoring where you're putting it down there. It, it's a low enough number that I could, I mean, a high enough number that I could justify it within reason, but it builds in a lot of cushion for mistakes or for extra profits. And it also allows for an opportunity for a higher either assignment fee or, you know, more wiggle room if some of our buyers come in and they find something that I might've overlooked because that's happened too. Um, that's usually where I start. And then I go and I follow up with them. So what are your thoughts on that? And then I'm silent. And I just let it hang until they say something. <laughs> 25 minutes later. I mean, it's a funny story, but there was a person that I, I did that with in his basement and we stared at each other for five minutes and then finally he accepted. <laughs> I'm awkward just thinking about silence for five minutes. <laughs> well, I mean, in that natural feeling is a powerful tool. That's what it is. People want to fill the air. And if you can use silence to your advantage, 
it, it really does work. And because now that's when people are racing, their thoughts are thinking, can I take this much money? Does it make sense? No, I can't, I can't, I can't. And they're, they're, they're rapidly thinking. And then usually they'll start verbalizing a lot of that. And then as they're verbalizing that, we can take that, okay, here's some of their objections now that are coming out. How can we either overcome them? How can we find a good solution to them? And if it's just the number, then you say, okay, well, what's the best you can do? And then I'm silent again. <laughs> and then that's kind of where the negotiation starts taking place. And in a book that I, I, I held off on reading much longer than I should have, uh, Never Split the Difference, is a oh, really yeah. strong sales book. If people haven't read that one, um, I listened to it like five times as soon as I, the first time I got through it, I'm like, oh man, there's gold all over this book. So um, if, if you're looking for a negotiation strategy, that's a great book for it. Uh, and and I, I mean, I was inherently doing some of it, but not all of it. It wasn't as systematized and, and process-based. So that's kind of what I've been trying to work on a lot more is creating this exact playbook. And, and there's tools out there that, that kind of go over it. I um, you know, there's Sandler sales training. John Martinez has some training. Um, so, you know, a, a real estate version of the Sandler training, but it, it all does kind of come down to similar stuff and just being able to tie as much of the tactics in as possible, the, the best you're going to, the best likelihood for your success rate is, but I always come back to, you have to care right. yeah. a little bit. I mean, you know, you don't have to, and that's sometimes a challenge I think people fall into too, is that they care too much. And when I say that, it sounds bad, but it's not. Because if we start trying to adjust our numbers to make them happy, I have not seen too many good resolutions that come from that. Either we have to cancel the contract or we have to go back and renegotiate or we have, they, in their head, it's sold, but it's not actually sold. And for whatever reason, either we didn't communicate it well, or they didn't totally grasp that this number is just a trial number. If, if you try and do too much on trying to help them, it ends up being bad for everybody because your investors aren't happy. We don't make any money. They don't get their house sold. So sometimes trying to be too sympathetic, moving out of that empathetic into the sympathetic phase, mm -hmm. you can get yourself in trouble and you think you're doing them a favor, but in the, in the long haul, it just ends up wasting a lot of people's time and nobody's really happy about it. The, the resolution for the most part. Yeah. So you have to care about the situation, but you also have to keep the numbers in mind as well that, you know, this works. And sometimes, you know, the next phase, if we don't get the contract is you back off and you find out when the next time you should check in with them is. Okay. And then we just stay in contact with them basically until they sell their house or tell us to go away. <laughs> and even then we kind of think about going away. Yeah. Well, so what you said there about not caring too much, that's something um, that I, like to, the way that I like to relay it is um, that if we, we could go out and pay a million dollars cash uh, for a house that's worth a hundred thousand dollars. Right. But we'd probably only be able to do one or two of those deals. And then we wouldn't be able to help anybody else from that point forward. We'd be bankrupt. Right. And, and there's no return on our investment for, for doing that. And, and so the amount of people that we'd be able to help by cheating on our numbers uh, goes down. If, if we stay with our numbers, we're going to be able to help more people and more homeowners um, get out of sticky situations by following our criteria than we would if we, uh, you know, went and blew the whole wad right out the gate. And, and I, I think you owe it to your business to stay uh, true to those numbers. I mean, that's an incredibly valuable point. And, and I don't think enough people take the time to think about their real estate investing as a business. You know, you, you've got to be running, you know, your books, you've got to be having a profit and loss. You've got to understand where the money's going out, where the money's coming in. And you're hundred percent right. If, if you miss on your numbers, it can cripple you or kill your business. And if you want to make it a business, you've got to treat it like one. That's how you build a better business. And that's kind of what the inner circle is a lot of all about is building that better business for you. Cause many people just go, okay, yeah, I flip, you know, a couple houses a year and, and they restart the wheel every time they do it. They don't follow a, a method of, of the madness. I mean, every place is going to be a little bit different because you need a little different work, but you know, th there should be a process filed, right? You go out there, you, you build out a scope of work. You try to use similar materials for similar style jobs. You try to use the same contractors if they don't flake out and go crazy like all of them do, um, which is why I wholesale mostly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but for real, I, I just, I don't like managing people all that much. I love coaching. I love talking with people, but I don't like being a babysitter. That stuff drives me nuts. And in my experience, a lot of, you know, contractors are needed and, and that's why I'm not great at managing, at least not yet is I, I don't like circling back and cleaning up people's messes. I make a big enough mess myself. <laughs> yeah, no, That's really a full-time job. I mean, you need a project manager if you're talking about if you're talking about babysitting, just strictly in the um, flipping part of the business. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's the thing, right? Is if you're going to be starting your investing career, think about it like a business. You don't have to go crazy. You don't have to have nine different types of, you know, business cards. You don't have to have, you know, the, the fanciest website on the planet. Um, you know, start trying to generate leads and try to figure out how you do that consistently. Yeah. Yeah. Put that Good. in a CRM those leads and you, you stay on top of them. And then, you know, as you keep working through your business, try to build out a system or a process for each step that you're taking. That way it can be repeatable. And that's how McDonald's tastes the same in Japan as it does here because they have a process. They have the same ingredients. They, they, I think they do. Um, <laughs> but, but right, you're following the same assembly line platform and, and there is a little more nuance to what we do than that. But for the most part, if you can, you know, get 80, 90, hundred percent of it to be systematized, it makes it a lot easier. And then you can also look back, okay, what went wrong here on this project? Even if you were successful on it, were there opportunities where you could make more money? Cause if you're doing 10 deals a year and you can make an extra two grand, I mean, an extra 20 grand in your pocket's awesome. That's like almost an extra flip for some markets. Right. So being able to figure out where can you squeeze out margin consistently and where can you make repeatable? It turns it more into that business that is sustainable, that is consistent, that can keep giving you the opportunities for leads, can keep giving you opportunities to convert those leads, gives you a pipeline for your flips, your rentals, your wholesale, whatever type of exit strategy you might be working on. And if you start thinking about it, you're gonna change it time and time again. Like right, GM, I'm sure, is still changing their processes and right. increasing their efficiencies. Because the beauty of the second you start treating it like a business and building a better business that's right for you and what your goals are, the sooner you're going to start collecting data and the more data you have over a longer enough period of time, the more you can really laser focus the specifics to your market, to your, your strengths, your weaknesses to try and accommodate that. I mean, my partner and I just ran through our uh, marketing from the past three years and we recognized that out of, I think the 60 places we were marketing to like 18 of them were actually consistently profitable. Okay. So we'd get these one-offs in certain areas and, you know, we, in our heads, we're like, oh man, that's an awesome area. We should get more of it. But, you know, we spent $60,000 in marketing there for a $50,000 assignment and it's taken up a chunk of our, a huge chunk of our time. Wow. Well, we lost money and we're spending a bunch of time and energy here. Why don't we just focus into the areas that make sense? And, and that goes back to, you know, having a business that you can track your numbers on and build out a way to understand, okay, this works, right? If, you, if you're using a, like the same cabinets, but they break every time. Well, maybe you could recognize that after doing it a few times and you, you swap out the, the make of your cabinet style or whatever it is that you're using. So the more you can track the data and, and don't go crazy. I mean, I'd start off with macro numbers, like big numbers. So how many mail pieces are sent out or how many dollars you're spending marketing and, and try to at least isolate those to a degree. And then, you know, you can historically look back on that and go, oh, these ones make money. I should put more money into these channels and I should take money away from these channels because they're not producing. But as with anything, it does usually take, you know, for early, early indicators, probably three months, um, for medium six months, but you know, ideally the longer you have the better until you know, or you're reasonably comfortable. This is a bad thing to keep doing. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Yeah, that's really good. Um, Mike really kind of wrapping up here a little bit. You've given us so many valuable nuggets. I wanted to talk a little bit about inner circle elite and kind of what you're doing there. And then maybe how people who aren't a part of inner circle elite might be able to reach out. Well, thank you for that. And yeah, so Inner Circle Elite, um, you know, Don and I kind of got together talking about this and really, you know, to quote Tim Ferriss, we built it to scratch our own itch. We <laughs> noticed that, you know, there's a lot of mastermind groups that are out there and a lot of them are great. So I don't want to say one's better than another. It really has to be designed specifically what you're trying to get. A lot of them focus exclusively on flipping or on wholesaling or maybe a combination of the two. We wanted to build our mastermind around having the best investors in the room and building your business to ultimately, you know, building a better business. How do you make your business serve your purpose, not somebody else's goals or dreams or numbers? Because it sells a lot to say, yeah, let's do $10 billion in assignment fees every year. But I've scaled a business up and to be honest, it was a lot of work. And it was work that I didn't really love doing. And I started to see that, okay, we're generating more revenue. But we're not keeping much more of it. So we've actually scaled back down and doesn't mean we won't go for it bigger, better again later. And, and bigger doesn't always mean better. So the reason we just started the group is so we could help investors and ourselves put together the best minds of active people that are actually out there doing it to share ideas and share different ways of earning 
money on the leads that we generate, whatever that looks like. Our group has flippers. Our group has wholesalers. Our group has, you know, creative finance people, landlords, um, syndicators, you know, finance people. Like it's insane the level of investor that we have in our group in, in lots of different areas. And just from the, the last event that we were at, I, I stumbled upon a, like a strategy for creative financing and selling off um, houses on land contract. And there was a guy there and he ended up saying, oh yeah, this is what I do. And he just gave me, basically he, he shortcutted, you know, probably six to 12 months of work on my end of trial and error to going, oh, so this inkling I had that I just kind of stumbled on works and it works pretty darn well, at least for my market. Nice. So I'm, I'm starting to lean into that. And, and now I've just shortcut my own thing. So really the, the goal of the group is to make it member focused, not like, hey, there's these four or five, six coaches that you go to for everything because I've been a coach in another group and I don't know everything. If you ask me how to flip a house, I could tell you the, the nuts and bolts kind of, but I'm never going to be as great at it as Don because Don Costa is probably the best flipper in America. Mm -hmm. if I, you know, if I'm being biased, but not biased at the same time. Um, so he's a better person to ask. If you want to talk about, you know, creative financing, I'm learning it. I could put you in touch with someone in our group that's really good at it. So the reason we built this group was to help, you know, get people into a position where they're trying to achieve their goals, not somebody else's. Cause we all got into this for one reason or another and everyone's reason is going to be different. Mm -hmm. And if you're chasing someone else's dream, there's an old saying that I, I, I can't attribute who it was to, but you know, you don't want to climb the ladder and find out I was leaning against the wrong building. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's a lot of truth to that, right? We, we get stuck as entrepreneurs in the work sometimes. Mm -hmm. And what our, our group is doing is pulling everybody out every 90 days to look at it from a macro lens. Where are we trying to go? Are we still on that path? And what do we need to do to get there? And how can this group of elite investors help shortcut that path or tell us, Hey, that's where the landmine is. You should watch out for that. There's a pitfall over here. I fell into it. Here's how you get out of it. If you happen to fall into it too. Um, this doesn't work at all. Don't even try that. Yes. So it, it can save us a lot of time. It can save us a lot of money. And if we do stumble or find ourselves in a challenging spot, we want to make it that it's a safe place to share that because a lot of the other, you know, RIAs and things that I've been to, um, all it ends up being is talking about how great certain people are and only the good stuff they're doing. But I know for a fact that a lot of people are holding that stuff back. And in our event, I think everyone was pretty candid and honest and people were sharing some real struggles. And I personally believe that that's where the growth can take place yep. because you can overlook a lot of bad. If you're just cashing checks and making a ton of money, doesn't mean your business is great. I mean, <laughs> it means it's working, but it doesn't mean you're not, you know, there's not a bunch of holes in your ship. And if all of a sudden you, you come across tough times, those holes can sink your ship pretty darn quick. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So that's really the, the, about the inner circle. We're, we're putting together for, you know, established investors that are doing real deals and are open, honest and sharing and willing to have, you know, camaraderie to it. Cause that's a big part of it is the networking relationships. Mm -hmm. the, the stronger the bonds that we build, the more we can trust each other, the more we can share, the more we can all grow together and towards the goal that we want, not just something that's out there of let's do a bazillion dollars. <laughs> And oh yeah, if anyone wants to join or, you know, it's an invitation only uh, group. So if you feel that this is something that would be valuable to you, uh, you can go to be in this room.com and fill out an application. I'm personally talking to everybody, right? We don't have a hired salesperson to do that because we're not here to just cash checks. I want to make sure they're a good fit for the group. We're a good fit for them. Again, we don't want people to be in there if it's not good for them or it's not good for the overall group. And we're, taking our time to do that and as well as have, you know, a cap on the total members we'll ever have as well as individual markets. We're not going to let, you know, 19 people in one market in because then the sharing just dries up. <laughs> and if I just come in with a big enough check, I can get in, right? It doesn't matter about the application <laughs> process. I can just pay my way in. No, that, that is something that we are very steadfast against. I mean, there's a lot of people that have money, but and this isn't a knock to the people that have that. It's, it's, you just got to put a business in place first to join a mastermind because you will join and not get the value you need. Yeah. You'll pay more than, than is valuable to you at that time. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage people to get into a position where they are doing some consistent deals and now they do need to <clears throat> really tweak building that machine or they need the consultation of board of advisors. But if you're just getting started, I mean, you know, Don and I are working in the background to create some stuff to try and help with that. Uh, you know, area. And that should hopefully be coming in the near future. But um, yeah, if you, if you just have a check right now, you can't get in because there's not only are we trying to give value, but you've got to be able to offer value. And that's how a mastermind really does work. It's best is that everyone has ideas, has experiences and shares those. And then the cumulative whole is much better and broader and 
you know, attainable than by any individual by themselves. Yeah, definitely. And what about anybody else who might have, you know, more questions? Are you on Facebook or do you have a website anywhere outside of the Inner Circle Leap? Yeah, so I can be reached on all of the platforms. I'm not great at social media. Um, <laughs> um, but Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, um, it's the Mike Cowper, M-I-K-E-C-O-W-P as in Paul, E-R. Uh, so you should be able to find me on there. Um, I probably am at active mostly on Instagram and Facebook, uh, just because, you know, we have our Facebook group on there for the Inner Circle Lead as well. So I spend a lot of time in there. Um, but yeah, if you want to reach out to me on, on any of those, you know, send me a message and I'm happy to, to try and help out in any way that I can and, and, you know, just help people get further along the path because I know I've gotten a ton of help and I like to try and help others along their journey. And we're so grateful for your help, yeah. Mike. You know, personally, definitely, we're grateful for your mentorship. Um, and we're so thankful that you decided to come on the podcast today. Thanks, Mike. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me on. Awesome. Have a great one. Thank you for listening to The Real Estate Jam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, check out our website, shorefrontrestorations.com, or find us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Shorefront Restorations. If you have any questions, feel free to drop us an email at info at shorefrontrestorations.com. See you next episode.